so if you either turn your cells, uh, cell phones off or put them in silence, please. So, hello and welcome. My name is uh, Tomas Guilarte. I'm the dean of the Roberts Temple College of Public Health and Social Work here at FIU. I am pleased to welcome you to this forum on a public health emergency issue that is important and a concern for all of us in South Florida. On Monday, the World Health Organization declared Zika virus as a public health emergency of international concern. Here at FIU and in South Florida, we are the crossroads of the continent. We're the gateway to the Americas as well as to the rest of the world. The, the, world the World Health Organization tells us that the Zika virus will continue to spread. And so it is not a question when Zika will get here, it's already here. To address this and other important questions regarding the Zika virus, I'd like to introduce our panel of experts. First, Dr. Eileen Marty of the Herbert Wellham College of Medicine. Dr. Marty is a world-renowned expert in infectious diseases, has worked with the World Health Organization for nearly a decade, most recently in the fight against the 2014 Ebola epidemic in West Africa. Uh, Dr. Francisco Fernandez Lima from the, Art, the College of Arts and Sciences and Education. His research is focused on the development of new instrumentation and methodologies for biomedical and behavioral research. Dr. Matthew De Gennaro, also the College of Arts and Sciences and Education, is a neuroge neurogeneticist uh, with 20 years of experience in biomedical research and re runs the laboratory of mosquito genetics and behavior at FIU. From our Roberts Temple College of Public Health and Social Work, Dr. Consuelo Bexage, she's a pediatric infectious disease specialist, specialist and during her 19 years as an epidemic investigator in medical epidemiology at the CDC, she led dozens of investigations and studies. And finally, uh, Dr. Caroline Lusby from the Chaplin School of Hospitality, her vast experience in tourism industry has helped to identify and address potential negative impacts of people, culture, and the environment. Welcome to all the panelists. First, I would like to give the panelists uh, a few minutes to provide their own perspective on the Zika virus and the spreading of the Zika virus. Uh, and then I will um, give some questions and discussion and we'll open up the, uh, the question for, uh, for the audience. Um, Dr. Martin. Good morning, hello everybody. Uh, yes, Zika. Um, Zika is named for the Zika forest, which is a, just a small stretch of land but in the Entebbe Peninsula in Uganda, right uh, on the edge of Lake Victoria. Why? Because that, that's where we found some monkeys that, uh, excuse me, one particular rhesus monkey that had a fever, and they had the wherewithal to be able to detect and identify it as a new virus. And that's really an important thing to know, that if you seek, you will find. And one of the reasons that we're starting to become so aware of Zika is because in, uh, in 2000, in 2007, there was an outbreak of Zika in the Yap Islands. It looks a lot like dengue, it looks a lot like chikungunya, but the doctors there said, eh, it's a little funny looking. Not, not quite the same thing. Let's figure out what this is. And they did. And they were able to recognize that it was a different virus that affected, in the end, about three fourths of the population. 2013, same thing happened in French Polynesia. And that was the first time that was an association was made with neurologic diseases in humans, in babies. And now we've seen this tremendous outbreak in uh, South America, particularly in Brazil, where there's uh, over 4,000 babies that have been born with a disease that occurs in a background of about 100 cases a year. So this is really a dramatic increase. So there is a spatial and time link to this virus, which by the by is not exactly the same Zika that was first described in Africa. It's changed over time. And that might help explain why we're seeing what we're seeing now. Hi, my name is uh, Francisco Fernandez Lima. I'm, uh, I'm from the College of Arts and Sciences. Um, what my perspective is more on the prevention of diagnosis. We are more like we're looking at the molecules inside living cells and things like that. So 
what I want to point out is in the case of Zika, you know, it's, it's a virus and it's changing constantly. So the prevention is very important, but more than that, the diagnosis, you know, early diagnosis is what actually, you know, will help you, you know, go through the disease. So there are multiple groups, you know, across the country, and especially here at the FIU, that are actually working on this type of question, you know, how we can detect these molecular changes, you know, early on, do it relatively cheap and provide that, at, you know, at the point of care. Hi, I'm Matt DiGennaro. So I study the genetics of mosquito behavior. And can I have my slides? Or are we going to do them now? OK. So I guess they're not ready. All right, but anyway, so I can, um, my work basically is about how the vector finds people. And the, all right, great. So here is the vector here, Aedes aegypti, and it is known, uh, I don't know, many of you have, may know that this is the world's deadliest animal. It is responsible to, for 725,000 deaths a year, although humans are pretty deadly too, actually. Um, and um, there is a lot of new strategies that are evolving now to try to um, prevent uh, mosquitoes from biting people or create um, wild, uh, so we can change the wild populations of mosquitoes potentially through genetic modification to make them resistant to disease. So one way is to introduce an uh, antipathogenic agent that will prevent the transmission of disease. So basically prevent the mosquitoes from becoming sick with these illnesses, because actually these viruses and malaria also infect the mosquito as well as infecting, pe infecting people. So it's not like it's a good thing for mosquitoes to have these viruses or uh, the plasmodium that causes malaria. So people are developing ways to change populations, and these can be very, very low-cost solutions because it doesn't involve the traditional methods of spraying and constant mosquito control. Um, and just one example of this is the uh, Wolbachia. So Wolbachia is uh, an insect parasite that lives in cells. And what you may notice here is that this is stained for Wolbachia in green and dengue in red. And you can see that the dengue cells do not contain Wolbachia. And so Wolbachia is excluding dengue infection from cells. And so there is a um, large effort supported by the Gates Foundation, and it's called to Eliminate Dengue, where they're trying to release Aedes aegypti mosquitoes that carry Wolbachia to prevent the transmission of dengue. Normally, Aedes aegypti mosquitoes, which is the vector of uh, Zika and chikungunya and dengue and yellow fever, does not have Wolbachia. So a laboratory in Aus Australia created this mosquito and is now breeding it and releasing it and doing field trials. But I don't work on that stuff at all. Um, I work on how mosquitoes are attracted to humans. So female mosquitoes are the only mosquitoes that bite. Males do not bite. Males live on nectar, actually. But uh, females sense at a distance body odor and CO2. And then they move closer to the host, to the human host. Then they encounter body heat. And that further attracts them, so that they, they so they really know this is a good target for for the mosquito, and then they land on the human host, and then they taste the skin with their legs, and then they find a place to bite. So um, what we don't really know is the genetic basis of this, and so I am working on the odorant receptors that mosquitoes use to find people at a distance. So they, they smell, uh, you know, this is basically how they smell humans. So, and if we understand what these odorant receptors are, which ones are important, we can design new attractants and, and repellents. And uh, 
I can discuss why you might want an attractant that may seem counterintuitive, but it can be very useful. Okay. Dr. Bixagin. Thank you. I just want to do like a 60-second. Could you use a microphone, please? I'm going to do a 60-second, three-point, um, three-bullet um, statement and because I, I don't want to uh, take a lot of time from the conversation that we're going to have today. But my three-second thing is, um, first of all, um, every th agent that is sexually transmissible is not necessarily sexually transmitted, a sexually transmitted disease. This is primarily a vector-borne disease, a mosquito-borne disease. Secondly, even uh, diseases that are very mild, uh, generally speaking, when you have an explosive epidemic, you can see a very, the very wide range of the natural history of the disease, and you can see a sizable um, increase in the burden of disease if it's large enough to actually have these uh, more unusual uh, manifestations come out. As a pediatrician, as an infectious disease person, as a mother, um, I know that you know that even though it's a very tiny proportion of um, the, the morbidity and mortality caused by, um, by Zika, um, the congenital defects are a major, major uh, part, major, the most probably, in, in my mind, a very important part of the impact of this, of this disease. And the third thing is always epidemic investigators are asked, this thing was around for a while, why now? Why explode? That's an interesting conversation, and it's a conversation that really is very instructive and informs uh, us. We learn a lot from each epidemic, and many epidemics that are very, very <coughs> different teach us a lot about the next epidemic. Thank you for giving me this time. Dr. Lewis. All right, good morning, everybody. <laughs> so tourism is interesting, right, because um, we think that the virus actually ended up in Brazil for the 2014 World Cup, right? So last year, we actually broke the 1 billion tourism mark. That means we had over 1 billion international tourists traveling. With so much people flow, there is always um, risk for diseases to travel around the world, right? And Brazil is an interesting case study because we have 6 million visitors that go there each year. And we have the Olympics coming up, which, of course, you guys are aware of, right? Brazil expects to um, have about a half a million tourists for the um, Olympics, international tourists. But before then, we actually have something else coming up in Brazil, which is going to draw the same crowd, and that's um, the carnival, which is happening this weekend. So um, big numbers of international tourists and what that does to the flow of diseases and the flow of people is going to um, impact South Florida, potentially. More than Americans, we have about a half a million Americans that go to Brazil each year, but more than Americans, we have Brazilians traveling to Florida. There's about 1.6 million Brazilians that come to Florida each year. Um, tourism in Florida, if we are getting too panicky, and that's what the um, United Nations World Tourism Organization warns of, could actually lose a lot. We have 90, 98 billion, um, million tourists that come out of state and internationally to Florida. Our income is $82 billion, $82 billion spent in Florida from tourist expenditures. So when we look at the wider economic implications of a potential panic uh, reaction, we could lose a lot. And we'll talk about that. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Marty, I'd like to uh, pose the first question to you. Uh, the World Health Organization has made two very powerful statements, rapidly spreading in, in South America and a public health emergency. Could you please put into context these statements and can you also tell us whom does the virus affect and how does it affect them? Right, well the first part, <clears throat> the, the rapid spread, Consuelo alluded to it and that is the fact that uh, it's entered a susceptible population. People who have never encountered this virus and have no uh, natural immunity to it. So that's part of the reason that there's a rapid spread. It's also new to uh, Aedes aegypti uh, as a major vector. 
Okay? In other places, whatever the 80s mosquito is has been the major vector. So there are a lot of different 80s mosquitoes. In, for example, Yap Island, it was uh, 80s Henslei that was the major vector. So now we have a susceptible mosquito and a susceptible population, and it's growing like crazy. One thing we're concerned about is 80s Albopictus, because Albopictus can go into temperate areas, and it's here in the United States, as well as 80s. Uh, Egypti. So uh, it, we're not 100% sure that Albopictus can also transmit it, but we suspect that it can, since it also transmits uh, chikungunya and dengue, which, as we know, we have endemic cases right here in Florida on a constant basis. So that's about the spread, and that's one of the reasons we're so concerned. The second thing is the declaration of this as a public health emergency of international concern. And I uh, have been in close communication, even though I literally just got back last night from Africa, uh, with individuals who are on the panel that made the recommendation to Margaret Chang that this uh, be the case. Now remember, it's been declared, declared a FIC, a public health emergency of international concern, as a microcephaly and neurologic problem, not as Zika virus itself. And that's an important difference. And it is this uh, new uh, newly recognized issue with Zika, which, uh, as I mentioned earlier, was originally first described when it caused an outbreak in 2013-2014 in French Polynesia and has now caused a massive problem in Brazil that is making this come to the forefront because, as several of my uh, colleagues here have mentioned, that is the gravest problem. Uh, I, one thing I, I could add about the different vectors. So one of the things, I put that slide uh, up about Wolbachia, actually. One of the differences between 80s aegypti and 80s albopictus is that 80s albopictus actually has Wolbachia. So it may be competent to transmit the virus, but it's not going to be able to transmit it as well. And here in Florida, we have Aedes aegypti, and it's one of the few areas of the United States where we actually have it. So, um, and Aedes aegypti is a much better vector for dengue, chikungunya, Zika, et cetera. And I, I do think that we need a lot more study to figure out how competent uh, Albopictus is. But I think for people in Florida, I think we have to be more concerned because we have the likely most competent vector for, for Zika. Dr. Lusby, you, you just alluded to the magnitude of people traveling today globally. And I wonder if you could tell us how concerned should people be in Miami as we are the gate to the Americans and to many parts of the world? Um, that's a good question. So basically um, what we have is people traveling and then the people infecting mosquitoes and then the mosquitoes infecting other people. But in terms of an official response from Miami Tourism, we haven't really had any. We know that there has been cancellations in the Caribbean and also in, um, in Brazil, and that people are worried about Miami. What we do know from tourism is that there's a, usually a generalization effect. So even if it's not here yet, people might clump the area together with, oh, Central South America, Miami, it's all the same. So even if we don't have it, we might see actually adverse effects. So right now, so far, we don't have any, any issues in tourism yet in Miami. So I, I think one thing I could add on that is that one of the things that makes us in Florida a little bit safer is that we have much better mosquito control me uh, mechanisms in place. We, um, and also, uh, we live in homes that are, have screens and like we're not, we have air conditioning and these are all things that mosquitoes don't really like. So we, we kind of prevent access uh, of the mosquitoes to people in ways that is not happening, let's say, in Northeast Brazil where people are a lot more impoverished and they don't have the same kind of uh, housing that we have, which is, you know, a major issue for a lot of mosquito-borne illnesses throughout the world. And I would like to add that um, the World Health Organization made a point of making sure that the, the closing of borders and restriction of travel is not something that WHO is in any way endorsing. Um, individual countries may, may wish to do that, but definitely not WHO. Dr. Beck-Saget, just a, a question to you. Why now? 
Uh, we, we just, uh, Dr. Marty alluded earlier that this virus has been around in Africa, first identified back in 1947. And uh, many years went by, many decades, without any uh, um, knowledge about the virus. All of a sudden, in 2007, we started to get cases. What is happening? Is it climate change possibly a conduit to some of these uh, uh, effects? And some of those explanations are so attractive. And I would like to first echo what, um, what has been said. Those are very, <clears throat> very important points. A susceptible population, a, um, a situation where, um, where the vector is extremely well suited for it, while at the same time balancing out uh, in terms of our own impact here at home, that that vector really does not like air conditioning, really does not <laughs> like um, screens and this kind of environments that we, that we have a lot of in South Florida. But there are some points that you bring up that we haven't talked about, um, and among them are the, um, the steady warming um, and tremendous amount of rainfall um, and heat that we have had throughout the continent. My understanding is even throughout the world, this has been a very hot year. 2015 has been a very hot year, and Aedes aegypti um, do very well in environments where there's a lot of standing water for long periods of time in, in around dwellings. The urbanization that we have experienced as a species, and specifically in low and middle income countries in Latin America and the Caribbean, we have had an explosive amount of urbanization. We've come together very much. We, we have, we're talking about very crowded urban centers. And then, last but not least, um, something we really haven't talked about a lot, but it was beginning to be intimated. Emergence of infectious diseases very often has a, um, an underappreciated, understudied uh, socioeconomic component. Poverty and inequalities are the substrate of emergence of infectious diseases in large urban settings that have a lot of overcrowding. For many of those people, obviously their first choice is not to live in environments that are so, um, so suitable for uh, vector-borne illnesses. And I would like to add, uh, dovetail on that and say a couple of things. Number one, that increase in temperature speeds up the development of the mosquito dramatically. So a one degree change can change the time that it takes a mosquito to go from egg to larva to pupa uh, to adult from a, a week or two to a few days. So you have that, many, that much more growth. Also, that increase in temperature speeds up the amplification of the virus inside the mosquito. So you have a double reason why that increase in heat has propelled and made this such a dramatic increase in cases. Um, and last but not least, addressing your issue of, you're both right, of course, we, we have air conditioning, we have screens, but these are day biters. And most of us go outside during the day. And so we have to be, bear in mind that unlike al um, the mosquito Anopheles that transmits uh, mainly at night or dawn and dusk, these 80s mosquitoes will bite you in the middle of the day. Dovetailing on that, <laughs> just one more little dovetail. Um, we're still in a situation where we have seen susceptibility to chikungunya, uh, susceptibility to dengue, and yet we don't have huge dengue problems here, in part because people are a little bit more sensitive about um, insect repellent, and we have the resources to do that even during the day. And raising consciousness on that, sorry, for people here, especially the ones who are going to be traveling to places where there's a lot of Zika transmission, I think that's an important message that we have to give to people, that it's not just during the evenings, because we've gotten so accustomed to thinking evening, 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 uh, early morning. Uh, but I have to go back to the um, socioeconomic thing. One of the great advantages that we have here is that the kind of urban poverty that is driving this and that we sh should be very, very clear and present in our minds as we try to um, stop the emergence of infectious diseases also has a very adverse, um, a very adverse impact on the infants and children that are unfortunate enough to bear the brunt of this epidemic.
if you're going to be neurodevelopmentally disabled, the worst place to be is in a low and middle income uh, country which has no resources for you. We have to start thinking, um, we're actually kind of late, thinking about that response in our countries which have been largely very um, indifferent to those children in the past. So, so, uh, so just one more thing. Also, we're experiencing this El Nino uh, unusual rainfall. <clears throat> And temperature is very key for mosquito development and for the reproduction, but also is uh, water. So there's a lot, our environment is a lot wetter than it normally is. So I think um, we could see an increase in mosquito populations over the next months because of this. It's not the this. heat, it's the humidity. Yeah, so it's a, it's a combination of like heat and humidity. It's like it, they like this very, it's a sweet spot of, of, for development. So um, I think that's, that's something to, to, to remember. But we, we do have a, a, a relatively good mosquito control program in Miami-Dade County, so I don't think we should panic. At, yes? We, we're going to have open questions in a minute, if you don't mind. Could you hold the question up for a second? So, well, okay. so you, you but do you, so you, you think that um, completely ineffective? So, okay. So, okay. okay. Uh, if you could please hold on the comments and question, we are, I promise we're going to have an open questions and comments. Uh, and uh, just one thing about that, you know, some people are concerned <laughs> about the repellent DEET and that it has possible like negative effects. It is a very, very, very safe repellent and it is useful when it is applied uh, every few hours depending on how much you're sweating and how warm it is and things like that. So I, I think if you're traveling in particular or if you're gonna be outside all day and you're in an environment where you know there's gonna be a lot of mosquitoes, I would recommend everyone using the repellent. It may smell a little bit, but I think it's, it's worth, worth it's it. It's worth it. Yes. yes. Not so, to mention that uh, both CDC and WHO uh, also has approved three other possible ingredients that also work equally well, almost equally well. Uh, they, some last a little longer th than others. Picaridin, R R3535, and oil of lemon eucalyptus could be used instead of DEET if you don't like DEET. But, but the, the thing is, I, I actually did a lot of work on DEET during my, my postdoc and worked on the molecular mechanism of how it worked. DEET is still the most effective repellent, and it works both at a distance and on contact, which is not true of other repellents. So I really think that um, it, it's still the gold standard of repellents, and I, I think whether you really like it or not, you don't want to get it, you don't want to get sick. You know what I'm saying? Like, I think it's just better to use D. That, you know. So, so the next question, actually, Dr. DeGenaro, is for you. So there's currently no treatment or vaccine. Right. Uh, so what are the next uh, steps in terms of research? Well, I mean, I am not a virologist. I mean, I study mosquito behavior, but I would say that it's, 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 mu it's important for us to understand whether to connect the, the virus with the microencephaly. I think that's one of the, the key things. I mean, right now we have a very strong correlation, but it does not, it's not a, a concrete proof that the virus is causing this microencephaly. Although I think the rec recommendations uh, given by the CDC and Brazil are all very prudent. So I'm not saying that it's, there is no connection yet, but we just haven't fully um, explored that. The other thing is um, I think we, we need to do some basic science research on Zika, which has not really been done. And, and you know, there's been some evidence of possible sexual transmission. How is that happening? Why is that different from some of the other uh, viruses that are, are, are very similar, like chikungunya? and dengue, things like this, I think, are, are fascinating. How, how the virus has changed, and um, is, that connected to the is that connected to this recent outbreak, or is it due more to environmental conditions, global warming, increased rainfall, things like that. So I think 
there needs to be work both done in the laboratory and sort of in the field to understand how this, uh, this epidemic has come to be and, and how dangerous is it really? I think the money should be put primarily into rapidly developing a vaccine. I think this is the, the type of virus that vaccine development will not be that tricky for. Uh, it, it's not as confusing or complicated a virus as, say, the dengue viruses, and that will, that will protect the most amount of people the soonest. So that's where I would, you know, if I were directing research bucks, that's the number one thing I'd be interested in first. This is actually, I hate to, to call an epidemic like this an opportunity, but you rarely have situations where there's so much documented transmission and you have the resources to just go and start working on that kind of a prevention measure. This is the perfect bug for a vaccine, and I, I say, like, totally. So there's, there's been association, as we indicated uh, previously, with the microcephaly and neurological uh, disorders. Since this mosquito carries other viruses, as you indicated, is it possible that some of these neurological abnormalities are related to more than Zika? Is it possible that it could be a combination of viruses? Any, right. any, any data in that regard? Well, actually, that's exactly one of the things we're looking at, is if, if there are cofactors involved with the development of these neurologic problems in the babies. Uh, so things to look at, is, you know, has, has one of the, you know, as was said earlier, these viruses mutate all the time. This is not the exact same Zika virus that was, you know, present in uh, in uh, the rhesus monkey in Africa, et cetera, et cetera. So that's a factor. Another thing is cofactors, so uh, some kind of uh, genetic predisposition in, in populations that happen to live here. Unlikely because we're so diverse, but yes, you have to look at that. Uh, other concomitant infections, possibly from the same uh, mosquito transmitter or from other things in the environment, and also uh, other things that people do in Latin America, something that they consume, something that they're exposed to, et cetera, that is not Maybe common. Maybe nutritional factors, N toxic factors. There's a wide variety of things that we have to explore whenever we're looking at something congenital, because pregnancy is a very special kind of uh, susceptibility state. What, what we now know, of course, is that uh, some of the babies that have been born with microcephaly uh, my colleagues have been able to isolate the, the Zika virus from the, from the newborns, uh, as well as also demonstrate antibodies to, to Zika. But there is a background, because we have known for years about uh, other things that can lead to that condition. And, and so some of the babies that have been tested did not have evidence of Zika at this point. So, so Dr. Losby, <clears throat> as individuals that may be traveling to South America, some of the other countries where this infection is, is taking place. What should we do? Should we get up on the plane and clean our seats? <laughs> <coughs> That's a good question. Um, so as my colleagues said that basically right now there's no restrictions on travel or trade recommended, but there is a level two warning, which basically means using precaution, especially for pregnant women. I know that if you're pregnant, certain airlines like American Airlines and United are able to um, refund your ticket or change your tickets to um, a different time. And certain cruise lines are doing the same right now. So we know from um, Royal and Norwegian for sure that they're also doing the same, offering different itineraries or um, allowing um, pregnant women to travel at a later point in time. In terms of precautions, I know that um, there is a recommendation for airlines to be disinfected, and I know that they're doing that. Um, the Caribbean Tourism Organization has sent out uh, reminders constantly to the hotels in terms of what they can do, going along with the measures that we were talking about, basically making sure that there's no stagnant waters, that um, you know tanks are covered, that um, travelers are given, given like mosquito nets if there's no screening, those kinds of measures. And in terms of individual, using DEED, bearing long sleeves, those kinds of things. And in terms of the CDC <coughs> recommendations for pregnant women, uh, I know that the CDC is getting ready to put out a message regarding men because of the recent discussions on um, rare but real possibility of sexual transmission of this disease. So you're going you're to be seeing that, and I have no idea how the airlines and the cruise industry is going to respond to men who have wives at home. Uh, <laughs> so, Yes. 
So I was happy to see that the audience is eager to make comments and ask questions. So I would like to open up uh, the panel to uh, questions and comments from the audience. If you could please go to the microphones, identify yourself, and indicate who you're affiliated with. Hi, thank you for having this panel and taking my question. Uh, my name is Dan Chang. I'm an alumni of FIU and a reporter for the Miami Herald. And I wanted to ask about how strong exactly is the connection between Zika and microcephaly, this cluster or increase in birth defects that we keep reading about, and what needs to be done in order to confirm that there is a, a more than just a correlation but an actual causation? Okay, so in order to make that definitive statement that this causes that, a number of different types of studies have to be done. So one type of study which has indicated that is a problem is that geographic and time factor. So when the new agent enters an area and then uh, obviously, <laughs> there's an incubation period for babies, too, you know, about nine months, right? So we have to look at, at, at the impact in, in space and time. In that way, yes, it's definitely been correlated. The next thing is you want to do individual case studies to see uh, whether, as I was alluding to earlier, a baby born with this problem, if there's indication in either the mother or the newborn that it had been exposed to Zika. That's the next thing. The next thing is you do cluster studies. And these are more complicated studies. And, uh, and you've got to do uh, studies uh, over time. <laughs> The other thing, and last but not least, is to do work on non-humans to see if we can uh, demonstrate this happening in a non-human animal. And whether or not it does happen to a non-human would not rule it out in humans because all animals have their unique aspects. And humans might happen to be more susceptible or not, but still those studies also need to be done and confirmed. Consuelo? Uh, there's another, um, another type of um, study that we do when, we, uh, when we're looking at an epidemic, and those are typically epidemiologic studies. Um, in this case, one, um, but the, what's underway are case control studies and cohort studies, and while those typically um, do not say cause and effect, they say strong statistical correlation, uh, we, we rarely do um, strong uh, statistical correlation uh, anything beyond that in maternal and child health um, studies. That's the way uh, case control studies, that's how we linked aspirin to Rye syndrome, that's how we linked prone sleeping position to SIDS, and that's how eventually the, uh, the link is going to be established statistically between infection, not necessarily ex just exposure, infection with the microorganism and congenital microcephaly in these infants. Uh, all of those things are, are actually, um, the, stu the studies kind of like support each other, and that's, that's the one that's, already, that's on its way, but it's not completed yet. I think just, I, I would just want to add just one quick thing, is just that we would also want to know how is the Zika virus causing this particular microencephaly, because I think that that would be, um, I, I think it's really important, and if there's some issues with vaccines or other things, we, it might open a space for different types of treatment for pregnant women. But Dr. Gennaro, uh, important to note, we generally, and with those examples that I gave, those are classic examples of being able to control an epidemic without ever really finding out details of how uh, the toxic uh, uh, effect actually results in the infant poor outcome. Um, this is like an emergency kind of thing that's also uh, Dr. Marty and then part Fernando. of the story. Yeah, and, I, and dovetailing on both of you, uh, you know, we, we've known for a long time that this group of viruses uh, have a love, so we call it tropism, for neurologic tissues. So Spondwini group viruses to which Zika belongs is, is, a, is a virus that is a group of viruses that are known to have a, a love for neurologic tissues. So uh, going beyond the fact that they love the tissue and how they damage the tissue will be very, very interesting and will support it, but it <coughs> won't be absolutely necessary for us in terms of being able to make recommendations to, for pregnant women. Fernando? Yeah, uh, I just <coughs> want to 
kind of try to break the problem in two parts. Uh, so there is a virus and there are some effects that this virus, you know, develops in humans and in other parts. And now we're talking about microcephaly, but it could be others, you know, we, we will have to see. Hopefully there are not that many others. Um, so there is, there is two things that you can do when you have this type of situation. You can work on the prevention where with the vaccine or, you know, other ways to, to mitigate the effect. And there is the second part of the problem is when the person is infected, what you want to do about it. So for the second part of the problem, which could be, you know, depending on the, the, you know, the virus and the event, you can have more or less, then the basic science approach is the only way to solve that. And most of us have been trained on dealing with these type of problems. I mean, that's what we do day to day in the research labs. So there are multiple questions that you can pose uh, on model animals, for example, on how would this virus will affect and what will evolve and what are the consequences. And that's the normal way we actually develop antivirals, uh, drugs, and things like that. So it's, it's a known process for us. I mean, you just have to have the right attention you know, when needed, and we need to have the resources to do it. So, you know, as we go, there are a lot of researchers that work on mosquito-generated uh, disease, and, and there is a large background of information that we can use. When there is a new virus showing up, you know, one of the smart things to do is, you know, get those people and put them to work on the problem. You know, there are people that need to work on the prevention, and there are people that need to work in the solution of the problem when it appears. So. Let, let me just put in context uh, the association with the microcephaly. So in 2014, the number of cases in Brazil in, in a year was about 100 to 120 cases. Since the Zika virus, the number of microcephaly cases has gone up to about 4,000. So that gives you an idea of why this is an important association and we need to understand it. Dr. Losby, I think you wanted to make a comment? No? Okay. So, next. <clears throat> yes, good morning and thank you. My name is Richard. I work for the Department of Defense, UN Southern Command. Uh, we potentially bring a huge logistical capability uh, to help out uh, through multilateral uh, engagements as we did in Haiti for the earthquake. My question is, are, are there... Um, are there any multilateral, multinational responses that can leverage the resources of large organizations such as the U.S. military as well as militaries downrange or other organizations? Um, uh, and what can we do to help this out? Or are we really just helpless and just all we can do really is just say, hey, please close your windows, please use screens. I mean, is there something out there that can, that can be brought to the table by governments other than just advice? Well, I know Brazil is actually yes. using the military and they are going through Rio and to the backyards and actually basically spraying and trying to take any stagnant water out. So that, you know, and that is a, uh, an international effort as well. Hoorah. <laughs> <laughs> 25 years, Navy. Okay. I know what the resources that the U.S. military has to bear, and they are tremendous and extremely useful, not only in terms of personnel going door to door and spraying mosquito stuff, far beyond that. We have uh, the Walter Reed Institute of, uh, of Infectious Disease Research. We have USAMRID. We have uh, uh, various different types of surveillance programs. We have wildfire. And these capabilities, I know for a fact, are already being harnessed to a degree, and there's communication going on at different layers of government as it is. Uh, oftentimes what the military does, and it's a tremendous amount of excellent work in regards to public health, uh, is not well known because it's passaged through the CDC or whatever other institutions. But the reality is, you betcha, we have a lot of use for the resources of the U.S. military, and I'd be happy to go back to Southcom and have a personal one-on-one -on -one chat with your commander. And, and I, I just like to add, so the insect repellent DEET was actually developed by the military in uh, with the USDA. So. You know, the, the Department of Defense has an important research aspect as well, and that, that was done because so many people had died during the, in the Pacific theater due to vector-borne illnesses. And so with the sustained effort of the military and the US, USDA, we were able to develop this repellent, which is still used today. So I think that there's a, a great role for the Department of Defense, and I think I can understand why the Department of Defense would be interested in this particular problem. Just a, a comment before we take the next uh, 
um, person from the audience. So DEET is not an issue in terms of um, um, usage of in adults. In but adult. there's, some, there's some concerns about children under two years of age. Right, Could so, you please expand on so, that? All right, so the reason why children under two, it's not recommended is because DEET is not great if you ingest it. And babies have this tendency to touch their skin and things like that. So it's like, uh, it's basically like, just don't ingest it. So that's why it's not useful for uh, young very young children. Next person from the audience. Hi, my name is Monica Flowers. I'm a nurse practitioner. I'm also a clinical assistant professor in the College of Nursing. And I'm currently six months pregnant, so this is, thank you, <laughs> except bad timing. Um, so I do have kind of like a three-part question. At any point in fetal development, is the baby considered safe if the woman is to contract the Zika virus? I, so, I would say that there, uh, there are periods during pregnancy where the risk is greatest. But to say that there are par parts of the pregnancy other than maybe the last few weeks tops, um, where it's absolutely proven safe. I don't think that's... Yeah, so I don't think... Oh, sorry, <laughs> sorry. Um, that was a, uh, like 50 words saying, not really. <laughs> um, there are definitely periods in pregnancy where the risk to any kind of... Um, any kind of the neurodevelopment is maximal, but as you know, during all of pregnancy, um, the preferential growth mm -hmm. in the infant, when the baby is born, practically all head, mm -hmm. because the preferential development is in, um, is in the brain until the last few weeks when the rest of the body starts catching up. So it would be very unwise to say, oh, there's a time when it absolutely makes no difference. Like some teratogens, uh, talking about um, closure mm -hmm. of the spinal canal, you can say, oh, you know, after the first trimester, and even a little bit before that, the train has left the station. Um, you can't do anything one way yeah. or the other. Um, but in, in this kind of situation, where there's a lot of different, um, e different points in the pregnancy, where you're talking about hypothalamic development, cortical development, um, it's, it's just more complicated. I think one important thing uh, to be aware is, is the, that, you know, there is, there is no, no given guideline, you know, to the public in general, so in how to approach this. So it's, it's more like a self-education of, you know, how to do it. So you really need to go and look what the CDC and the, you know, Florida Department of Health guidelines are, and they're actually very specific on the case of pregnant women and child. Uh, the second part is, you know, the virus can be asymptomatic, so that's actually a challenge. So that means that, you know, and we do not have a commercial test available, however, they are actually tests provided by the CDC and the Department of Health. So, you know, if you think that, you know, you are feeling, you know, someone are normal, I would highly encourage to go to see, you know, your uh, and that was actually part of my second question okay. was, with prompt diagnosis and treatment, does the passage there, limit? There is no specific treatment for Zika. I so didn't know if antivirals would, was sufficient. No, or we don't know. We, you know that, that's still up in the air as to any, whether any of the existing antivirals would have any effect whatsoever okay. and whether they would be more harm than good. So, uh, but, but for counseling purposes, you would want to know, and there's a schemata that the CDC has recommended if you're pregnant and you think you might have been exposed. N uh, nonetheless, it's a, it's a complicated, and I certainly wouldn't take the risk if I were uh, pregnant. No, I'm planning on covering myself with DEET from now on, so. <laughs> um, and my last question, so I apologize for anybody that has to smell me for the next three months. Um, my last question, I did not, I was not aware of the sexual transmission or implications of sexual transmission with Sika. How about nursing implications? Can That's you pass it on through breast milk? Absolutely not been studied, really. No, um, no. The, the, it's certainly possible. Uh, it's a bodily fluid. It could happen, but I, I don't think that if... Well, that's a very excellent question. I think we're going to have to explore it. Yeah. Thank you for asking it. Yeah. And the one, I mean, with microencephaly, though, I mean, after a certain point, that probably the baby would not be, there's no, there's no chance of the baby getting microencephaly once the brain develops. Right. But we don't know if there's, 
what an, the effect of an early infection of an infant would be by Zika. So there could, because usually with a lot of these uh, viruses, they affect people who are very young and very old uh, in a much greater way. Mm -hmm. But the, how that happens, I, I just think that there needs to be a lot more research into how Zika causes these different potential phenotypes. These, so. the, natural history of some, uh, the natural history of some uh, infectious diseases that caused microcephaly, congenital, uh, which is by definition uh, microcephaly is congenital, is very diverse and it's likely that there's a broad range for Zika too. I don't mean this to false, give you false reassurance, but there were a lot of babies born in Brazil without microcephaly who clearly um, had uh, perinatal exposure and prenatal exposure. So putting things into perspective, this is a very interesting time to be doing uh, research on this subject and I'm sure somebody's going to ask you along the line um, if, if you'd be interested in, uh, in, as you're a nurse practitioner, in actually um, keeping up some surveillance with your prenatal patients. Uh, I think people, n maybe not so much in Miami, but people in places where the outbreak is really um, going strong, they, they're, all of these questions um, may actually be, uh, have an opportunity to be addressed with an outbreak of this size. Thank you very much for your questions and good luck. So, so a follow-up question. How about a uh, woman that becomes infected and then wants to have a baby? Any concerns? Most likely, if there's been at least two months uh, that she's recovered, most likely there'll be zero effect and she'll simply have immunity. But those are also studies that need to be done. Hi, I'm, I'm Philip Stoddard. I'm a faculty here at FIU in biology. Um, I've also been the mayor of the city of South Miami for the past six years. About four years ago, I brought a microscope home and began learning how to tell mosquitoes apart and tell their larvae apart and began looking at mosquitoes. So this was before we got the chikungunya, before we got Zika. I was interested in dengue, which had just had a big outbreak down in the Florida um, in the lower Florida Keys. And I sort of wanted to know what mosquitoes I was looking at and where they were breeding. And what I found is um, what you've heard described, that Aedes aegypti is, is very common in urban and suburban areas. Um, and the places it lives and the places I found that I now go door to door in my city um, are municipal storm drains, ornamental and wild bromeliads, rain gutters, buckets, flower pots, dog dishes, old recycle bins, the ones the county used to give out, uh, wheelbarrows, uh, when you turn your wheelbarrow over the rim of the inverted wheelbarrow, uh, bird baths, fountains, derelict swimming pools, hollow fence posts, coconut shells, tire swings, corrugated plastic downspout extenders, discarded soda cans, coffee cups, and potato chip wrappers, rain barrows, pool toys, spare tires, and just about everything else that can hold water. You're a wonderful mayor. In fact, <laughs> in my, inside my own house, this is what horrifies me, inside my house, in the kitchen, my dog drinks water out of the dog dish and he spills a little water over the side. He's a dog. If I pick up the dog dish and relocate it, which I do every few days, several times a year I'll discover 80s Egypti larvae living in that little bead of water around the rim of the dog dish on the floor. It's horrifying. So, um, you know, when I said a few minutes ago that the county's mosquito control program was, was ineffective, that's not because they don't know what they're doing. It's because they're underfunded. And I want to make that distinction. These guys do know what they're doing. And what they know, and what they will tell you, is that in order to have effective control against this species of mosquito, you have got to go door to door and house to house because everybody will tell you they're not in my yard. And then you take them out in their yard and you show them well, look, they're right there, and they're right there, and they're right there. And they go, oh, my God, I had no idea. They're horrified. And then they get it. Um, but until then, everybody will deny it. Those beautiful ornamental bromeliads that people grow are mosquito factories. In fact, in Miami-Dade County and in the city of South Miami, you're not allowed to have bromeliads in your yard unless you keep mosquitoes from growing in them. Now, if you take a turkey baster to everybody's bromeliads, guess what? They're full of mosquito larvae. And mostly it's a, um, it's a genus called Wyomaya, but you'll also find Aedes aegypti in there. They're everywhere. And so there's a product you can buy 
called mosquito bits. And it looks like uh, post grape nuts. Uh, it's about 12 bucks from Amazon to get a big jug of it. And you take three or four of those little deers and sprinkle them into the middle of a bromeliad and it releases BT toxin, which is specific to larval diptery, uh, diptera, and um, doesn't even kill the nematodes. And it'll keep them mosquito free for a week or two. But you have to do it to every single bromeliad every week or they come right back. So, 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 so the problem, the problem is that this mosquito is a container breeder. It can breed in a thimble. It can breed in a leaf. It can breed in a bottle cap. And that we as a society, not to mention low-income neighborhoods throughout the neotropics, are absolutely unprepared for the meticulous and fanatical behavior it takes to keep these mosquitoes out of our yards. And the municipalities are making it worse because we've got storm drains. Every resident wants... They hate the standing water in the, in the streets. They want storm drains. So we put in storm drains. Guess what? They retain standing water year round. So either you get the ADs when they're relatively um, clean, or you get the, um, another genus, uh, Culex, when they're a little bit uh, grimy at the end of the dry season. So guess what? The municipalities are fostering the problem by uh, trying to keep things tidy. So we need some big changes here, or we're going to face uh, you know, we're going to face outbreaks in places like South Miami, places like Coconut Grove, um, some of the, you know, places like Miami Beach, places where you've got vegetation where mosquitoes can hide, and human habits. So that's my piece for the morning. Thank so, you. So, so Thank you. So I think I'd just like to respond. I mean, I think that there are also other mechanisms of mosquito control that have not been explored in South Florida. And these are some of these um, either genetically modified or altered mosquitoes that could be used. And, you know, there is this, uh, Oxitec is this company that has yep. released, uh, will release male mosquitoes which don't bite, that will species specifically find the Aedes aegypti female and render her functionally sterile and unable to reproduce. And so we can achieve population reduction through this, through this mechanism um, and it has been done in the Caribbean, it's been tried in Brazil, and I think that it's a lot better than spraying, which affects so many different insects. The, there is, you know, what we need to focus on is the Aedes vector, and reducing just the Aedes aegypti and Albopictus possibly as well, their populations in South Florida. And I would agree. I mean, the, the problem with the spraying um, is that Mosquitoes breed very fast. The life cycle of this insect is a, a week and a half to three weeks. And so it's just like antibiotic uh, overuse. What you do is you promote evolution of resistance. And so if you look at where we've had the longest mosquito control programs down in the, ski, in the Keys, the salt marsh mosquitoes down there, um, Aedes tinirhynchus, is resistant to DDT. It's resistant to dieldrin. It's resistant to malathion. They're now using um, pyrethroids and and um, organophosphates, but other species of ADs are actually evolving resistance to those in various places around the world as well. And I think what we want to do is to restrict the use of the insecticides to um, an occasional outbreak. So if there is an outbreak on this city block, you spray it. And you want those, you want those mis insecticides to be very effective. So you don't want to overuse them. And the problem that we face politically is that when the salt marsh mosquitoes come in in, in, the, late, in the summer rains, um, the residents complain like hell, and we're all under political pressure to do something about it. So the county responds to the pressures by spraying for salt marsh mosquitoes. But in the process, the Aedes aegypti get exposed, but of course not eliminated. And so they're going to start evolving resistance too. So it's actually counterproductive, just like overuse of antibiotics is. With respect to the Oxitec genetically modified mosquitoes, you know, they scare a lot of people, but they've been proven safe. And I, I agree with you, Matt. I think they're probably the, the smartest thing we can be doing within our arsenal right now. Um, it's expensive. And so, but so is going house to house. Yes. And so is, is, so is taking on a flavivirus um, epidemic, you know, be it chikungunya or dengue or, or Zika. They're all expensive. If you're going to spend the money, I would much rather we act intelligently and knock out the mosquitoes now and teach people how to do it than have to deal with the brunt of a, a viral outbreak. Yeah, thank I, thank I you for your I comments. Agree more. Uh, can we, um, I'd just like to uh, quickly respond. I think we all agree that more resources are needed. 
uh, I think we need to be proactive rather than reactive. And in order to do that, more funds are, are required. So we need to talk to the politicians locally at the state and the national level uh, for, for those funds because there's a lot of questions that need to be answered and they can't be done without resources. Next. Hi, my name is John Quintero. I'm a student here at FIU. I'm a member of the American Academy of Environmental Engineers and Scientists. And I wanted to know, considering that there's no treatment or vaccine, if we know how long the, the virus stays inside of the body. We know that when the, um, people who have had the virus and recover, uh, after about six weeks, we can no longer um, you know, identify virus, but the reality is by RT-PCR, it's usually gone within a week or two of them becoming symptomatic. So um, the longest that it's been identified is six weeks out, but in, in, in practical terms, it's generally uh, something that you can only really detect either by isolation uh, or by RT-PCR uh, very soon after acute illness. Thank you. For those that don't know what RT-PCR, can you please define? Oh, it's a type of um, polymerase chain reaction that uh, it's reverse trans. It uses a particular enzyme to very quickly um, make lots and lots of copies of something so that we can quickly tell what it is we're looking at. And we can see it in real time uh, on, a, on a screen, on a computer screen as it's done. It's sometimes called nucleic acid amplification test, right, yeah. Dr. Gene um, well, that's, that's just a general term for lots of different types of PCR. Yes, right. That's what I want. Oh, OK, general OK, because this is a specific kind that we use. Yes. Uh, but yeah. Right. Next, right. next. For those people who are not born knowing about PCR. Next. Hi, my name is Natalia Rosa, and um, I'm trying to get pregnant this year, not the best time, obviously. Um, and I'm, um, I have to travel to Central America constantly, probably two times a month. Um, is there any way that I can probably um, do both? I don't know, how often can you check if you have the virus on you when you come back from that country, or you wouldn't recommend it at all to travel? Uh, to Central America. Um. The, the current recommendation for a person with your situation that has to travel but is also trying to get pregnant is to take personal protective measures and do those uh, <coughs> you know, to a, as high a degree as you possibly can to avoid getting bitten by mosquitoes. So the right clothing, the right color clothing, the uh, DEET, if you will, or picaridin. I actually prefer picaridin. You can prefer DEET. I prefer okay. picaridin. Okay. It's a, it doesn't okay. stink, and it doesn't damage your electronics like DEET does. You just apply it a little bit more often, that's all. And it's, you know, safe for the babies. So that's the one you find in family versions of pick your favorite brand of insect repellent. Um, and that's what I would do if I absolutely had to go and also was in your condition. And that is the actual current Center for Disease Control and WHO recommendation. Thank you. Unfortunately, testing, um, you really can't act on the, on the test results. Um, so it's, and it's, since it's not commercially available yet, it's only um, for special situations. Um, it just would drive you crazy. Uh, as a way of preventing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next member. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Dr. Whitney Qualls from University of Miami. I'm here from the Department of Public Health Sciences. Thank you guys for putting this together. This has been really informative. Um, I, I would like to address how we talk about um, vector control. Um, I think it's really important that we utilize new technologies, but we also identify that it needs to be a comprehensive program. So one strategy, um, genetically modified strategies, aren't necessarily going to be the one tactic that will solve all of the problems. Um, I think this is something that we deal with whenever we work in Latin America. Also, is you, you want one strategy that's going to kind of help control the whole situation when we need to really be focusing on an integrated approach. And I would like to address that in the literature, um, the reports of working with um, the genetically modified techniques, all of the field trials and semi-field trials have actually gone in beforehand and applied an adulticide to knock down the populations 
to an acceptable, like a suppressed level before the application, which is great because this truly identifies that it needs to be an integrated approach. And I think um, Miami-Dade County, as we've already kind of discussed, one of the things that I think collaborating together um, would help to identify developing 80 surveillance. Um, there are tools available to help without having to go door to door so that we can kind of identify where these hot spots are. And I know the Keys has been doing a really good program with this, and this is something that if there's anybody here from Miami-Dade, mosquito control, um, that we can sit down and discuss. And I know that that's something that we're working with the Florida Department of Health and the local Miami-Dade mosquito control to try to better develop a fully integrated program for control. So, but I think all of these strategies are necessary and it's a great time hopefully to be in this field of research. Um, so thank you. Thank you very much, thank that's, you. that's great. And, and uh, <clears throat> I think the integrated approach is absolutely critical. I love Bacillus thuringiensis Israeli in particular. It's very, very effective. Um, you know, the, the genetic engineering, et cetera, but you're absolutely right. And you're right that our public health schools should work together. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Hello, my name is Elena Scherscher. I'm a graduate student here at FIU. I have a five-year-old and she's all over the place naturally. So she likes to go to the bushes and trees and all that stuff to explore. So I guess my question is, are there any differences in the manifestation of the virus in young children? And is it known that if there are any complications for infected children? that are not present maybe in adults? At this time, um, we've really only seen complications in people who have underlying diseases, right? So uh, maybe a little girl with sickle cell anemia would be much more susceptible to serious disease. But the age itself ha has not yet demonstrated itself to be a, a key factor other than mothers and babies. Thank you. <coughs> Good morning. Um, thank you very much for putting this together and for inviting me. Um, I'm Mickey Gonzalez. I'm with Miami-Dade Office of Emergency Management, which is a division of Miami-Dade Fire Rescue. And I have a couple questions. Um, what actions are presently being taken to identify, for those identified to have contracted the Zika virus? Um, is there any monitoring of them or any quarantine? Is that something that is an option? Very interesting studies have been done on, on people infected with Zika, and some people, even, uh, even people who have been voluntarily infected on purpose, um, don't even have high enough levels of viremia to transmit to the Aedes mosquitoes. Okay. Pick your spa uh, favorite genus, uh, species. Um, but you, ha you have to be significantly ill from it, I think. That's what it looks like for you to have a high enough viremia to be a risk for the mosquitoes, so, and when you're not feeling well, you don't generally go outside where you're more likely to be bitten by mosquitoes. So I think it's sort of a self-quarantining uh, situation in the sense that you don't feel good and you stay home. Okay, and then um, what is the planned level of response should there be any locally transmitted cases like here in the U.S. or in Florida or even in Miami-Dade County? I think at this time there's active surveillance for, but surveillance um, in terms of infectious disease surveillance, we're not, um, I don't think there's any point in, in um, trying to set up any kind of quarantines or limiting people's m movements because the limitation of movements, of course, that's relevant would be more with mosquitoes and you really can't, um, can't restrict them all that, uh, all that much. But I think, uh, and we don't want to set up situations <coughs> where um, like unnecessary panic. restrictions. Yeah. Yes, panic. Or, or any kind of a panic <laughs> in the community. community. At, yeah. at this point, um, and m most other vector-borne um, illnesses, people should be educated to recognize the symptoms of possible, um, possible infection, although they're very nonspecific. As you know, um, a rash, a fever, conjunctivitis, mm -hmm. those are things that people should be educated to, uh, providers should be educated and the citizenry yeah. to, uh, to report, to actually be examined so that some, there can be some surveillance of whether there is um, any kind of incidence 
in happening here right. in, and that people should mention their travel history when they're getting um, care. Those are common sense measures up to set up. Um, if, if, you really, if you really wanted to make a difference, okay, you would make it so that people who have these conglomeration of symptoms would be able to get tested and not have a personal expense. If you had that, then you would get your answers a lot quicker. That is the critically important um, point. And the, the thing about the cost barrier, mm -hmm. um, this would actually be so worth it. Yeah. So worth well, it to get that information. There was an article that came out um, from West, a West German biotechnology firm that actually has produced, and they sent the testing kits to Brazil. I think it was Monday that it was put out. And it's only like five euros, which is about $5 and 45 US, uh, $5 and 45 cents US. So the cost of it, I don't think is, is an issue. There is it's no the cost at all to yeah. get the health department to send it to CDC. Believe me, those people will be delighted mm -hmm. to, um, to test this as part of a, an active surveillance. No, process. no, 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 they're not delighted. They're, they're running short on supplies. They're freaking out. They actually, they're, they're, no, this is the Wait, truth. It's this is the truth. between delighted and freaking no, they, out. They would love, they would, they would actually love to, but they, they don't have the, the resources for especially the numbers of people that would be interested in knowing. That's not You're saying that the, the, the health department doesn't have the resources no, no, no. for the no, no, testing? No, no, no that, that the Center for Disease Control laboratories right now um, are already uh, working at capacity. And so they're not eager to have an overwhelming number of samples However, to test. State health departments get priority if they are, um, if they are actually handling, state health departments that in particularly affected areas, mm -hmm. and that would include uh, Florida. Florida and the Gulf, those would be prioritized because they do want to find uh, local transmission. They don't want yeah. to, um, to wait until there's some commercially available thing to, to actually find out whether there's local right. transmission. So some place between freaking out and <laughs> very <laughs> interested is <coughs> where, where it is, but priority, uh, health departments. My, my understanding is that the health department is doing the testing and we are very fortunate that we have a state lab here in Miami but those more elevated cases of people that are showing I guess more symptoms or more critical symptoms rather than the milder symptoms those are being sent to the CDC so there's a delay in getting I guess the you results really can't back. You can't do anything about it so the delay is not yeah. a problem yeah. so I mean it's the information is what you're going to act on. It's okay. only supported care that you're giving to, to patients. And so you're treating the symptoms? Yes, largely treating, mm -hmm. um, treating the symptoms in the very tiny minority that, are <coughs> that have significant symptoms. And the other thing is, uh, it, it's, you know, which test are you talking about, right? Are you talking about the RT-PCR? Are you talking about a, a general serologic test or a plaque test that specifies? Because the general serologic tests cross-react. And so a person with dengue uh, or with yellow fever uh, could also show positive for Zika because of the cross-reacting antibodies. And that goes into <coughs> a whole other interesting area. So it's that more specific, harder to do tests that are being done at the CDC. And, and also with the symptoms, we were told that, um, I, I read, I think it was on the, the WHO or the CDC website, that they're to treat the symptoms with Tylenol rather than Naproxen Absolutely. because of the dengue factor and the hemorrhagic. Mm -hmm. Yes, if you if you're have not ruled out a hemorrhagic fever, and who's gonna do that? Uh, most cases, you're, you don't really, you never really want to know whether you're dealing with chikungunya, dengue, or, uh, which is a potentially hemorrhagic fever, or Zika, which doesn't have any um, hemorrhagic effects. So actually, Tylenol is your friend. All right, thank you very much. And okay, I just we, have time. Leave, we have time for a couple more questions. I just want to say that um, with regards to mosquito control and what the county is doing, if you go to www.miamidade.gov slash solid waste, you can get the press releases and the guidance that's being provided. Thank you for being here. Appreciate it. Thank you. Hello, my name is Olivia Wills. I am actually one of Dr. Dejanaro's students, and I have two questions. First of all, Dr. Marty, you had mentioned that 
Zika virus is not as complicated as the dengue virus. I was wondering if you would please elaborate on that. And then my second question is, what is known about the different strains of the Zika virus and mutagenesis? Well, those are heavy scientific questions, but to, to try and make it so that everybody appreciates what we're talking about, um, dengue a long time ago was identified serologically to have four flavors, if you will. Sometimes it's been argued there's a fifth flavor. So one, two, three, four, dengue. And when you get type one, say, and you're re-exposed to type one, you have a protection from type one. But if the next time you see dengue, it's two, three, or four, then your body has cross-reacting antibodies, and therefore, uh, it doesn't necessarily work that well. And so attempts to make a dengue vaccine have been complicated by this reality. Plus, we know that uh, when, when, you, when you your body encounters different of the, one, of the four flavors, it has a higher risk that second time around of manifesting in a more severe type of dengue all the way to hemorrhagic dengue. That's something that's not an issue with Zika, although yes, there are different strains of Zika, just like there's different strains of humans, right, throughout the world. Zika is, you know, you can call me a human and you can call a, a person from Norwe uh, Norway a human or a person from China, we're all humans, but we're not identical. Same with Zika, we're not identical, there's different strains. So, um, in, it, we, you know, we're looking at the currently active strains, and it's a matter of trying to simply make something that is uniform across strains that is also not harmful and allows the immune system to be ready to uh, combat a, a Zika virus should it present itself as a wild Zika virus to you. Does that answer your question? Yes, I had read um, several articles online that stated there were two main strains of Zika. One is mostly af from Africa, and the other is from Southeast Asia. Correct, and 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 that's absolutely right. And now, once it got into Yap Island, they started seeing modifications and noted that it came from the uh, Southeast Asia uh, strain, okay? And then it, it modified again when, when it was in French Polynesia, and we're looking at what's happening now in Latin America. And most of the infections in Latin America come from the strain from Southeast Asia, is that correct? That is indirectly correct. Uh, af after the big outbreak in 2013-2014 uh, in French Polynesia is when it got to Easter Island, which is technically chilly, even though it's in the middle of nowhere. And, from, and also, it's the strain that's uh, perhaps, as you said, uh, came from the uh, 2014 games uh, into Brazil, also seemed to have come through that route. It could have easily have come from Africa because there's, you know, worldwide travel, but it seems to have actually come through that particular. Thank you. Uh, next guest, please. Hello, Jeff Beeler, the Department of Pediatrics Chair for Herbert Wertheim College of Medicine. One couple comments and a couple questions. First of all, we do support the Department of Pediatrics and pediatricians in general support the American Academy of Pediatrics recommendations for the use of different um, medications or preventative measures. I think it's important that we also make sure the public knows that those things that are approved are probably safe and very effective. Those things that are not approved and sometimes used locally by different people. Um, in my culture from Oklahoma, we use some things that are probably very unsafe. And so people need to be very careful about that. There's even parts of the world where DDT is still around and I would certainly hate for children to be exposed to that. So I would make that comment. The second was a question, uh, well, another comment um, we need to make sure that people who have children and parents are obviously very concerned and when they have a child that gets a mosquito bite now in Dade County, there's not an indication or Broward County to run to the pediatrician or run to the emergency department and expect testing. We've seen this before. We saw this with Ebola and everyone who had a fever suddenly thought that they needed testing for Ebola and now we're a little bit concerned that Zika is going to be the next test de jour. Um, some of those tests are not completely studied yet. We're not sure about how sensitive and how specific they are. So comment about that. And lastly, I have a real question, which is what is the distance that this vector travels from my home in, in Coral Gables is that if I'm infected and I get bitten by a mosquito, is someone in Broward County at risk for my mosquito? Or how, how, far, how far is the distance of travel? So, uh, 
Go ahead. Okay. I mean, the, the, the distance of travel is sure. not going to be from Miami-Dade to Broward, certainly. Um, <laughs> studies have been done where um, the mosquitoes can, let's say, like, if you're in a, they've been done in a lot of, like, small villages, small towns, and the mosquito can travel throughout a small town. But, and this would maybe, this is the, the, this is probably less than a mile, usually. But the, what happens, you, the transmission sort of works more that mosquitoes bite people and then they move around. And then, then the mosquitoes bite them and, because the, actually people are usually a lot more mobile, especially in our society, than the mosquito. And I totally agree, uh, adding the caveat that mosquitoes can travel on the wind, so if the wind blows hard. Well, maybe. I mean, there could be. That's one thing. And number yeah. two, uh, just saying, yeah. uh, we know this. And n number two, uh, it can, the Zika virus can live in a mosquito for 10 weeks. So once the mosquito is infected and the virus has amplified, it's got 10 weeks to find you. Okay, you have just the privilege of the last question. Hi, thank you very much for all the information. For me, it's obviously also very important at the moment. Yes. <laughs> um, I'm, my name is Greta Burchard. I'm a student here at FIU, a PhD student. And as a graduate assistant, I'm working, especially right now, very closely with people from Latin America who are coming here and traveling here. And I've been bitten by mosquitoes the last week, so <laughs> I've noticed it. So my short question is only, would you think that it would make sense to test, just because I'm, I have been with them the last weeks, and I will be next week with, with the Latin Americans, I mean, and I've been bitten by mosquitoes. So you were talking about testing, and I wasn't too concerned until now, but now I was thinking maybe it would make sense to test. But I, I would say definitely um, that's, you're not a good candidate for, <laughs> for this. And I wanted to modify that, that um, just to prevent misunderstanding. The idea of having sur surveillance, it, it would be looking for people who are, have symptoms suggestive, uh, and certainly just hanging around Latin Americans, you're gonna have to go to a very exotic place in Miami to not be exposed to a lot of Latin Americans and a lot of yeah. mosquitoes. I mean, that would make us all be... So maybe not the ones who come traveling here recently, like who... You'd be surprised. Um, there's a, I would, I, I hate to reassure people because that sounds so patronizing, but I would definitely say, and I'm going to let others um, comment, I, I would say no. So I think that what would be more important, though, is for you to sort of avoid mosquito bites at this very moment. Mm -hmm. So I would recommend DEET. <laughs> and uh, I would, I think I would, about the uh, I would very strongly he has, recommend He has shares in this stock. <laughs> It, it, has, it has been proven safe and effective, and it's the most effective repellent. Okay. And I think that if you're going to be in a situation where you're going to be exposed to mosquitoes, just wear it. Okay. Thank you. Guten Tag. It's freut mich zu lernen. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, Thank you. Not hideable, right? <laughs> uh, let me just uh, say real quick. I agree. Um, you know, but first of all, it is winter. Mm -hmm. There aren't a lot of mosquitoes around, so you've been perfectly fine. Number two, our, our mosquitoes currently have not been identified to be infected with Zika. So again, not an issue. But yeah, let's be safe, especially since you're how far along? Seven months. Seven. So you, yeah, you, the warmth will come. Yeah. And so will the mosquitoes. <laughs> okay. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. So I, I want to thank the audience. And I want to thank the panel for a great discussion. Uh, just any final thoughts from the panel? 30 seconds. One second. I am so grateful that people are not waiting for a huge body count in the United States to get interested in this disease. It warms my heart. So I, I'd just like to, to finalize by saying that this is another example of the immense importance of public health professionals that are out there every day working hard saving lives and preventing disease. So thank you very much and have a great day. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>